friendo, Steve here. Welcome back to Ask Wrestle Juice. Got a lot of questions here in the community thread from the last time I posted one of these and I didn't get a chance to read them all last time. So we're going to dive into this. Before we get started, do me a huge favor. Hit that like button. And if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button. And the notify bell really helps Wrestle Juice grow. Let's get into this. Uh, Ryan Maizu asks, uh, if you had the ability and freedom to set up a pay-per-view for a WrestleMania type show with companies like New Japan, AEW Impact, and WWE, how would you book the show and how would it be something that fans would like to see? Number one, fans would die to see this. They would love to see it. Uh, you got to bring out the big names, though. You got to have the big matchups. You got to get the Tribal Chief Roman Reigns in there against, I don't know, I guess Kenny Omega, uh, Okada, uh, whomever. Uh, so you got to get the big names. Get like Jay White versus Seth Rollins versus, uh, I guess, Adam Cole. I don't know. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you just you, you, people would flock to it. You don't even have to promote it. The, the idea of WWE and all these other companies doing something together would be huge. Now, I actually do think that in 2022, we are going to see a Forbidden Door pay-per-view. I think AEW, New Japan, Impact, they're all going to get on the same page for one show and book out a big, major, non-WWE uh, massive event. Uh, I think they're going to do it once and maybe they'll try to make it a yearly thing. That's my prediction for next year. Hopeful Hero says, hey, Steve, uh, where do you see Braun Strowman and Bray Wyatt going and how likely is it that they end up in the same company? Well, Bray Wyatt seems to be doing some Hollywood stuff right now. That was reported by Fightful Select. Uh, and uh, I don't know what that means for his uh, pro wrestling days, to be honest with you. I kind of figured that, hey, he's a what second or third generation wrestler. Like it, it would make sense that he'd go back to wrestling, but uh, apparently that might not be the case if he's working with some Hollywood people on the Warner Brothers lot. That's pretty crazy, um, but not shocking given that he's a, an incredibly creative guy who uh, seemed to be really into the cinematic stuff that they did back in WWE, and that would translate to the motion picture industry, I guess. Uh, let's see here. L asks, what do you think it would take for wrestling to be mainstream again? There are a lot of guys that have the potential to be huge, but what needs to happen for them to get there? The competition is a lot more fierce these days. I do feel that WWE has dropped the ball so many times when it comes to building potential mainstream crossover stars uh, in a way that would make people want to tune in. You got to cut it out with the corny bullshit. There's too much corny bullshit. In WWE, I mean, AEW has a chance, but they're still years away from being able, I think, to have that mainstream impact. WWE has the money, they got the resources, they have the marketing arm. It's all in creating characters that can cross over into the mainstream. And they really haven't done a whole lot of that. And they need to work on that. Um, I guess they're a billion dollar company. What do I know? Uh, Deep voice, dude, how would you rank the fall rank the following names by how likely they are to appear again in a WWE ring again? Uh, Adam Cole, Kenny Omega, CM Punk, John Moxley or Tony Khan. Wow. So how likely are they to, uh, are they to appear in a WWE ring for some again, for some for the first time, Adam Cole is really young. He's like what? 32, 34, something like that. I think, and, and he has maintained a very diplomatic stance when it comes to uh, talking about WWE since, his, since he left. Uh, I'm going to go here. So most likely, for me, I think it would be Adam Cole. Uh, then it would be Mox. Then it would be Kenny Omega. Then it would be CM Punk. Then it would be Tony Khan. I feel like... If Vince McMahon retires or passes away, he's old. Um, I think there's a much greater opportunity because then if you get guys like Triple H or HBK, who's running NXT 2.0 right now, if they land head creative positions or even ambassador positions with Vince gone, I think that opens up a lot. I think if they sort of change their philosophy on how they approach wrestlers, That'll probably change a lot, and maybe it'll open the door for more people who might have been put off a lot last time there in WWE. Uh, Adam Rogers, can you see AEW absorbing another promotion such as Impact, Ring of Honor, NWA, or MLW in the next few years? No, there would be zero need for them to do that. AEW doesn't seem to care much about wanting a tape library. 
I guess, because they don't have a streaming service and I'm not sure if they're really interested in doing that. I feel like if they wanted to buy at this point, if they wanted to buy all in from Ring of Honor, they probably would have tried to have done that. Or if they, I mean, if they have tried, it hasn't been made public. No, I think that they'll just wait these companies out. If anything happens to these companies, then they'll uh, they'll wrap them up. But they they care about the AEW brand. You know what would it, what good would it do them to buy Impact? They have an extensive tape library, but that's kind of all that they would really need. Um, so I don't I don't really think that would happen. I think it's more likely that stuff like Ring of Honor would happen. Where unfortunately Ring of Honor are on hiatus. They released all their wrestlers. If they come back, it might be on a per appearance fee. That's if they come back. Everybody's acting like the company's dead, though. Uh, Soul Bones. Since she's the topic of conversation in a lot of places, which would you say is the most egregious Charlotte booking decision WWE has made? Um, Number one, putting Charlotte over Sasha Banks in 2016 and 2015 um, and then 2017 and 2018. Number two, uh, having Charlotte beat Asuka at WrestleMania, uh, shoehorning her into the Rousey Lynch WrestleMania 35 match uh, when she had the NXT title, suffocating the women's division over there, never putting over Rhea. Uh, the most egregious example of Charlotte Charlotte's booking Probably in my in my in my opinion, it would be not the Sasha thing at the beginning, not that. I think it would probably be boy, those other three are really good. The highest profile one was the WrestleMania 35 thing. I think shoehorning her into that was completely and totally unnecessary. I don't think she detracted from it, but I think it was probably unnecessary because they already had a massive main event with Lynch, with uh, uh, Ronda Rousey and Becky Lynch. Uh, I think the most egregious one, the most egregious one would be the NXT title one. The fact that she never put over Rhea Ripley on screen. That's the biggest one because she was, that story was a ratings draw and then when she beat Rhea Ripley, it just, people tuned out. People totally tuned out. I'd say that one. They kind of buried NXT with that one. Uh, some guy. Who do you want CM Punk's first loss to be? He says MJF. I agree. I think it totally should be MJF. I think CM Punk is telling a story right now where he's having a problem putting people down in the mid card. He's having a hard time with guys like Bobby Fish and Matt Seidel. When he comes up against MJF, it should be easy pickings for somebody like MJF who's booked really, really strong. He gives Punk his first loss. MJF goes on to beat Hangman for the title. CM Punk continues to build himself into an actual winning wrestler and eventually beats MJF for the title. They come back around to it like a year later, so like two years from now. I think that's how you do CM Punk. I actually really like the CM Punk story they're telling right now. Kind of Grump asked a similar question. When do you think CM Punk will get around to the AEW title picture? If he does, I hope it's like a year or two from now. Uh, let's see here. Jacob asks, any plans of team going in raw defending the Quizlemania Tag Team Championships anytime soon? Once we get the call, we'll we'll be there. But we have not got the call. Uh, nothing nothing has been on that front lately. Uh, he or Gamer asks, when will, we, when will we have another Stone Cold Steve Austin review on pay per view? I gotta I gotta get motivated for that. I I, I really need to get back on those because I enjoy them. I know you guys enjoy them. I need to do them again. Uh, Jaden asks, what's your favorite wrestler outside of AEW and WWE? It'd be Jay White. I love Jay White. I think he's great. Uh, Red Tube. Uh, Red Tube. Asks, how long do you think Roman will be champion? Will he hit that 700-day mark? I think it's going to be three years. I think he's going to have a very long reign. A very long reign. And it wouldn't shock me if um, Gable Stevenson beat him for the title. Uh, Nathaniel Shiver. What are some big WrestleMania matches you see on the Raw side next year? On the Raw side next year, we've got uh, Big E, we've got Seth Rollins, we've got Edge, we've got uh, Randy Orton, Matt Riddle. That's the match. I think WrestleMania will finally get Randy Orton versus Matt Riddle. I think that's going to be a big, that might be for the title as well. Zach Brimer, what do you think of MSK getting booed in NXT? This is the, mo this is the question we get asked the most. 
over at Going In Raw, and now I'm getting it asked here. I always hesitate to answer it because it involves a child and parenting. And that is tough ground to talk about because I don't like to talk about that stuff because there's a child involved. Um, so yeah, I would say if the reports, and you guys can Google them about the reason why MSK was getting booed in NXT are true, I think it's a shame. I think it's uh, ugly and it shows a lack of judgment on the part of some people. That's all I'll say about that. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Reek Rosser. Why do you think Tony K is stuck on the 18 to 49 ratings? Much ado has been made about the 18 to 49 demographic because that's the demographic that advertisers really love to have. I am not a ratings guy. I am not a television executive. I know dick all about that stuff. The only reason I know about the importance of the 18 to 49 rating is because everybody talks about how important it is. Um, I think Tony Khan uh, likes to focus on the positives and the wins and uh, likes to downplay the negatives and the losses. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Uh, John Davies here asks a similar question. Do you think Tony Khan is in dangerous of, uh, of hubris? He's done a fantastic job thus far with AEW, but some of his recent comments hint at overconfidence. I know as a promoter, he's trying to spotlight his product, but you think in the long term, it could have a negative impact. I don't think in the long term, it could have a negative impact. I think that he's a man who is trying to rally the troops, being his locker room, his employees, and his fan base. And I think if you keep your fan base passionate about your product, uh, they're going to continue to spread the good word about your product. And that's good. Um, I don't really see much negative about it because I don't think that he's being toxic about the way he talks about it. Um, and I think it's important to focus on the ratings. I think you can be enthusiastic about your own product and run a, a good ship in the meantime. I don't think they're mutually exclusive. People who say he should focus less about this and he should focus on running his show. I think he can do both. I think it takes about two seconds to tweet from the phone. So I think he can do both. Um, is he in danger of hubris? I don't know. He's a billionaire son. I kind of, that's a different world. <laughs> that's a world of people who aren't used to losing. So I don't know what that means for a kid who's the son of a billionaire. I really don't. I think that he's probably, he seems like a nice guy. Seems like a very smart guy. Seems like a very creative guy. But he's also the son of a billionaire, and I can't really relate to that kind of individual. So I don't really, I can't really put myself in his head, right? He's younger than me, which is weird to think. He's very successful. Um, but uh, hopefully uh, he continues to grow AEW, and he continues to, do a lot of things right. <clears throat> um, Rocco uh, also says, uh, in my opinion, wrestling media tries to drag Charlotte's name unfairly. What other wrestlers do you think gets less than a, share fa a fair shake from the media and popular opinion? Seth Rollins. When he tries to be enthusiastic about the WWE, people shit all over him. And I understand that sometimes I feel like he crosses a line when he acts a bit resentful towards fans wanting to know more about what happens behind the scenes. On the other hand, from his perspective, he probably is the target of a lot of toxicity that goes to the WWE and to him that we don't really witness. There is a very toxic element to wrestling fandom. To most fandoms, there is that element and they are a very vocal element. A lot of us just like to mind our own business, watch wrestling and tweet about things that we like. There is that very distinct voice that is very loud and very vocal. It is in the minority that is very toxic. And I think that offsets a lot of the positivity around wrestling. Um, unfortunately, those fewer voices are much louder than the positive ones. And so um, I think Seth has been wrapped up in a lot of that stuff. Um, and uh, and yeah, I think that he's just doing his best to be Mr. Raw Raw for his company. And people say, hey, F you, because it's WWE, you're being Raw Raw about. So, um, anyways, there you go. There you have it. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. I appreciate it. Watch one of these other videos here. I will post a new QA thread this week for next week's videos. Thanks so much for watching. I appreciate it. I uh, hope you guys have a good weekend.